So if you wouldn't mind, I wonder if you'll humor me tonight. I want to do a word association game with you guys. So you can't be shy. You have to actually talk. So I'm going to say a word or maybe a series of words, and I want you guys to say the first thing that pops into your head. What do you think? You think you can do it? Okay. Okay, the first one is peanut butter. Jelly. Jelly. Okay, most people, most people said jelly. How about red, white? Blue. Blue. Okay, good, good, good. How about ham? <laughs> okay, a little bit, a little bit more of a, of a diversity there, but I heard a lot of cheese. I heard some other... I heard eggs, ham and eggs. Uh, Okay, what about broccoli? Okay, so we had we had a a range. Some I heard gross. Some I heard heard tasty. Some I heard I even heard cauliflower. Kind of looks like it, I guess. So what if I say poverty? Okay, I think only like two people said something. You can't you can't be shy now on me. Okay, what if I said being sued? Okay, I have one person who's cheating, I think. What if I said refugee? Okay, heard sad, flight, Ukraine. Uh, what about cheated on wages? Okay. So I didn't hear anyone, I heard one person kind of say it, but I didn't hear anyone say joy for any of those last four things. Why didn't you say joy? You guys. No, but that's, that's contrary to our thinking, right? To think of joy when we think of those things. But tonight we're going to talk about how uh, this, this passage that we're going through, these four verses at the beginning of the book of James, he's going to bring us to the point where we can see these things that happen in our lives as joy. But before we get there, we need to introduce this new book that we're in. We finished Joshua last week, and we get to start a new book in the Bible. And we're going all the way, you're flipping all the way through your Bible, all the way back to the New Testament and towards the end of the New Testament. And we are in the book of James, as Sarvia just threw her pen across the room. That's okay. Uh, But yeah, we are in the book of James, and we're going to start, obviously, at the beginning with verse one. And I think if we read through verse one, it'll help us introduce this book a little bit. So James chapter one, verse one. So the first thing we get is what? James, yeah, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we get the author of this book that we're gonna be studying and working our way through uh, the whole summer and beyond. Uh, And he says he's James. But what James? There's at least four Jameses in the New Testament that I can count. Is this James, the brother of John, that's, you know, with Jesus on transfiguration in the Garden of Gethsemane, one of his inner three? Well, it's probably not because he was martyred pretty early on before this James, or before this book was probably written. Most likely this was written by James the Just, a.k.a. James, the brother of Jesus. That is who the author of this book is. And James, actually, the name James is special in my family. My middle name is James. My grandfather's name was James. My nephew's middle name is James. It's like this thing where we name, have middle names of James in our family. And I think it's because my, my, uh, my parents have a special place for this book uh, in their in their upbringing, so we're all James. So I, I love the, the name James, but this person, James the Just, is mentioned in Paul's letters. You can read about him in Galatians and some of the other letters that Paul writes. Uh, and then he's also a very prominent figure. If you read through Acts, the James that you're gonna read about is the author of this book, James, the brother of Jesus. And he was one of the early leaders of the the church in Jerusalem. So he was right there with the apostles as they, and you'll read about him uh, in Acts as you read about the Jerusalem council and different things like that. That's the James that we're talking about. But James went on an interesting journey. 
And we can see this journey in Scripture. We could look all the way back in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 2 through 5. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers, Jesus' brothers, among whom would be James, said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see your, the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. And, that we get, and then we get the kicker. For even his own brothers, what? Did not believe in him. So it seems that in, in some way that James wasn't a disciple of Jesus necessarily. He didn't have this immediate faith in his brother the Messiah. And you read elsewhere in, in Mark that James and uh, Jesus' family came at one point to take him away when crowds were building because they thought he was out of his mind. So there was this, this sense of not really understanding Jesus, not really believing in him necessarily uh, that James would have gone through early on in Jesus' ministry and, and in, in, in his life. But then we read this in 1 Corinthians, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. Then he appeared, he being Jesus. So this is when Paul's talking about what he has taught, what he's handed down to the Corinthians about Jesus. So he talks about how he was crucified, he raised from the dead, and he appeared to all these people. And he says, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, Paul, also as one abnormally born. So here we get the mention of James that Jesus actually specifically appeared to him. So it seems that even though they had this, James had this rocky kind of history with his belief in Jesus, Jesus had a special plan for him nonetheless. And James had this transformative experience where he met the risen Christ. And it seems that at that point, James put his faith in Christ and became his follower and actually became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. So when we read James say, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, he could say, hey, this letter is from James, the brother of Jesus. I'm pretty important because I'm his brother. Listen to me. He could have said, this is James. Oh yeah, that guy who's the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Remember me? I, I kind of was head of the Jerusalem council. But he doesn't say that either. He calls himself a bondservant of God. Another way of translating that is slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So James doesn't need all that. He, all he needs you to know is that he is a servant of Jesus, of God the Father and of Jesus. So that's James' journey. And that's the person who wrote the book that we're going to be reading through. Hopefully it helps us understand the book better to understand where this is coming from. And it's interesting how he's Jesus' brother, yet he is writing a book in the New Testament, yet he has full faith in Christ, because it's our family that oftentimes knows us the best, right? And that's not always a good thing. They know our faults. My daughter sitting right there, you know, you all see me as a preacher and stuff. She could probably tell you some things about me that I might not want her to. But James had the same experiences with Jesus, but he was Jesus, we know, right? But James grew up with him. James was in the same household, yet even due to all, even, even uh, because of all that, or in spite of all that, I should say, James became a follower of Christ and put his faith in him. And God still used him, and he still recognized Jesus as the Messiah. So then we get, so we know the author of this book, now we get the audience of this book. And the audience, he says, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. The 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. When he said, you know, when we hear 12 tribes, especially coming from the book of Joshua, like we have been, you know, we can tend to think Israel and Old Testament and the 12 tribes with the land and everything, the 12 sons of Jacob. But more likely... James has in his mind Jewish Christians that have been scattered abroad because of persecution. So in his mind, when he's saying 12 tribes, he's referring to the, the fulfillment of the 12 tribes, which is the followers of Christ 
in the last days. And we see some of this in, for instance, Matthew chapter 19. Uh, Peter says, uh, Peter responded and said to Jesus, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will, will there be for us? And Jesus says something interesting here. Jesus says to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So in some, set, in some sense, Jesus has appointed his apostles, his followers, to be judges over the 12 tribes of Israel. And we also get in Revelation chapter 21, we read about how the, the 12 apostles are the, the 12 foundations, or the names of the 12 apostles are on the 12 foundations of the, the new Jerusalem that, that comes out of heaven. So it points to the fact that James is, is writing to Christians, believers in Christ, who are Jews, that are now the fulfillment of those 12 tribes of Israel, are almost like the new 12 tribes of Israel. That's who he's writing to. And he says that they're scattered abroad. That word is diaspora, literally. And you might have heard of that word, that phrase, which means people who have been persecuted who have had to scatter about. And that's these people that he's writing to. It's Jewish Christians living outside of Palestine. And I wanted to read a couple passages out of Acts just to put our minds kind of in the world that these Christians, these early Jewish Christians, would be living in. And I don't have it up there. I have it actually in the, the Bible. I'm going to be reading out of the actual Bible. Uh, so you can open there if you want, but I'm just going to read it so you can just listen. It's Acts chapter 7, starting at verse 57, and then I'm going to go into 8 and then skip to 11. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. This, of course, is Stephen that I'm talking about. He just gave this big sermon about the history of Israel and how the, the Jews had turned against their Messiah and crucified him. So they're rushing toward him. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called to the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. And then I'm going to go to chapter 11, and we see a little bit further what happened to these people. Uh, 11, starting at verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed Turn to the Lord. So we see this picture of a people who suddenly this persecution happens. Stephen is stoned and then this great persecution breaks out. And they're, they're being thrown in prison, they're being dragged off, they're being ravaged, and they have to flee. And then we see later on they fled as far as all these kind of different places in the Mediterranean world. And these are the people that James is writing to. These Jewish Christians who've been persecuted, who've had to flee their homes and flee into all these kind of territories. Maybe they had relatives, maybe they didn't know where they were going and had to live there as refugees, basically. The 12 tr tribes who are dispersed um, throughout the world. So that's the audience, and this is kind of the environment that James is writing to. And he says, greetings. It's like basically, hello. It's a, it's a pretty standard greeting. Verse 2, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. So here we get the theme of trials introduced right here at the beginning of this letter. And it's here we see the theme of trials in chapter 1, and then all the way at the end in chapter 5, at the end of the book, we also get the theme of trials. And James knows his audience. He knows what they're going uh, through. That's their dominant reality is trials. 
is suffering, is, is hardship. And to a degree, this has kind of changed. I mean, I read that, you know, we're not dragged to jail, most of us. We're not refugees, most of us, because of our faith. But some things haven't changed, right? We still live in a fallen world. We still live in a sinful world, and we all face hardships almost every day that we can think of. We face trials still, even though we're not in the same context, but we're still in the same fallen world. So the theme of trials is what we're going to be talking about, and James is going to have something interesting to say about trials as we go through these verses. So we'll start out with consider. James wants them to consider something. And this word consider is not an emotion, but a thought. He doesn't want them to feel all joy, but he wants them to think of all joy. It's an important distinction. It's not a feeling, but it's a way of thinking. Consider is what James wants the people to do. And he says, consider it what? All joy. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Now, when he says all joy, it's not quantitative, like everything about this trial is joyful, but it's, qua- it's qualitative, like it's pure. A good translation would be like pure joy. Consider it pure joy, not quantitative, but qualitative. So it's not that there, there's no room for any of their emotion. So if I come across a trial, it hurts me, I'm frustrated, I might be angry, but if I get any of those, then I'm not doing what James says. That's not the case. There's, it's not that everything is pushed out of the way because of joy. It's consider them pure joy. Consider them pure joy. And what is that? What is pure joy? Well, I think what he's talking about is like authentic, true joy. It's not fake happiness. A lot of times, you know, we come across trials, hardships, and we can... We know we're Christians and, and we know everything has to be good, so we'll exert kind of this fake happiness, but really we're dying inside. But James is saying, no, this is, this is pure. This is authentic. This is true joy that I want you to think about when you encounter various trials. A lot of people say, you'll hear people say, but I'm going to be okay. But I'll get through this. But, I'll, but, but we'll pull through. But sometimes it's like based off on what? Based on what? How are are you going to get through this? How are you going to pull through this? And a lot of times they don't. They say they will, but that sticks with them their whole life. And sometimes they never recover. But James is giving us a new mind frame to come at these trials that we encounter. Not that we're going to be happy and joyful when I get in a car accident, But it's that when I think of it, when I think of that trial, I consider it a joyful thing. I consider it a good thing in my life. You might be asking, why? Why would I do that? Well, we're going to get to it when we keep reading the next couple verses. And I think of it like training. Like if I'm training to, my daughter just ran a 5K actually with a program at school. And luckily, she didn't ask me to be her running buddy. She asked my wife. But if she did, I would have to train for that, right? And I don't know that I would necessarily look forward to the training to run a 5K. I wouldn't look at that and say, oh, I'm I'm joyful I get to do that. I I get to run and sweat and get tired and, and, and experience pain. But I know the outcome is good and healthy and wonderful because I would get to do that with my daughter. So it's, it's these trials, I'm thinking of them as they approach as something that is good, is joyful. It's not something we naturally do, but this is what James is telling us to do. And he says when you encounter various trials, and the literal like Greek translation for this word would be fall into, like I'm walking along and I fall into a pit or something. So this, these aren't things that we seek out, you know, we don't seek out bad things to happen to us so that 
we can have joy and, and God can do all the things he wants to do uh, for us through them. These are just things that happen to us. So basically James is saying this is the attitude you need to have when trouble comes your way. When trials, when you fall into trials or encounter them. And then we have trials. What, what exactly is this? What is he talking about? So this word, this Greek word, because the New Testament was originally written in Greek and we translate it to English, so the, the Greek word here could mean like outward trials, things that happen to me that are negative, or it could mean like inward temptation, kind of temptations that come along. It's translated both ways in the New Testament. And I think here it's clearly trials. I think that's a good translation. It's outward things that happen to us. But trials can lead to temptation, right? Trials can lead to temptation to doubt God, to hate others. A lot of different temptations. So that temptation idea could be here as well. But I think mostly he's talking about these, these outward trials that we go through. And what were the trials that they were going through? I mean, I gave kind of the background of who he's writing to, but what were some of the trials they were going to? Well, we can see some as we read the rest of this book, as we look at the book of James. Poverty was a big one. I mean, most of these have to do with being a refugee and uh, having to leave your home and, and being persecuted. And one big thing would be poverty that they would deal with. James deals with a lot of poverty in his letter. So we see that's a big thing that they're dealing with. Religious persecution. James talks about how they're being dragged into court and sued basically by the authorities basically because of their belief in Christ. So, so in that way, religious persecution. They're being taken advantage of. He talks about how these wealthy landowners are kind of shorting the wages and taking advantage of people. So we see some of that. Maybe probably because they're easy to take advantage of. They're... they're Easy prey, right? They're refugees. They're, they're followers of this weird sect that follows Jesus. I can, no one would be mad if I take advantage of them. And then we have kind of the things we read about with Paul, dragging them to jail, persecuting them that way, real physical danger that they were going, under, going through. So that's the trials. When we hear trials here, that's the trials that the, the recipients of this letter were going through. But we have our own trials, right? And James says various trials. Other translation says when you encounter trials of, of any kinds. So he's not just necessarily talking about just their trials. He's talking about the trials that come in life. And certainly you're sitting there and you're thinking of your own trials, things that have happened to you that you've had to go through. Maybe you've taken James' advice here and seen, them, seen joy in them, an opportunity, or maybe they stuck with you and made you bitter and full of hate. But we know the trials that we go through. And one thing I've been amazed, you know, I've, I've just been going to this church for almost a year, and one thing I've been amazed with is the um, faith in the midst of trials I've seen in people. I mean, I, ha- I have a person, my, uh, a woman in my Sunday school class who the week her husband died, she was in my Sunday school class, ready to learn about God, ready to praise God. There's another man in this church that I know, uh, I think it was a day after his wife passed away, he was, in, he was actually in my Sunday school class too, ready to learn, ready to praise God. And I come from a context, I come from a different church to this church, in that context, I mean, we had things like that happen, people would be gone disappear for years and that's that's if we were lucky that they came back and you just see a different level of maturity you can see that some people take this to heart and that and we'll see that that grows maturity and you can see that and I've seen that in some of the people at FBC so verse 3 James says knowing so so you're going to consider it all joy when you face these trials Knowing, so that word knowing shows us that, okay, here's the reason. This is, now he's going to give us, he's told us what to do, now he's going to give us why. Why do we consider these bad things, these trials, these these terrible things that happen, joy? Well, because he says, knowing that the testing of your faith 
produces perseverance, produces endurance. And this word testing is a very rare word. It happens here, it happens a couple times in the Greek Old Testament, and everywhere else it's used, it's used to describe like refining silver or gold, the process of testing and refining those precious metals. The actual word is dokimian. Everyone say dokimian. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure you're still with me. But that's the Greek word here for, for testing. And it's not a testing like, to see if your faith exists, like testing your faith to see if it's there. No, the testing is like thinking of it like refining. It's testing something that's always there to purify it and make it stronger. That's the testing that James is talking about here. So I have a picture here. This is actual gold that was found in Arizona. This is just a picture of unrefined gold. And you can see the the dirty parts, the parts that are not gold, right, that need to be refined out of it. You can see it's very raw, and it, and it has these faults, and it has, you know, uh, lumps, and it doesn't, I mean, it might look uh, attractive to you because you're like, that's still gold. I can get money for it, but it doesn't look super attractive. It looks dirty. It looks, looks uh, f- faulty. But James is saying that difficulties in life refine our faith. They're they're the things that will purify us, purify this gold, the actual trials that we go through, the actual difficulties that we face. And he says that that the testing of your faith, the refining of your faith, produces endurance. Another way, and it might be translated if you have a different translation, another way to translate this is perseverance. It literally means a person who kind of successfully carries a load over a long distance. It's this idea of kind of building up stamina to be able to do something for a long time. And we see, see this idea uh, mentioned in Luke chapter 8, the parable of the, the sower. You guys know this parable. Some, some seed falls onto the road. Some seed falls among thorns. Some seed falls on shallow ground with rocks in it. And some seed falls on good soil. And Jesus says in verse 15, but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So these are the people who persevered. And we read about how, how there are thorns and there's different things that happen. There's birds that come and eat. But these seeds have persevered and they've been refined and then they, they produce a crop, a great crop. That's the idea of this endurance or perseverance. It's not a passive virtue. It's not like I just sit and say, oh, ho-hum, this bad thing happened to me, but I'm just going to get through it. I'm just going to sit here and just take it and get through it. It's not a passive virtue. It's an active choice. It's a literal choice you will make when something comes your way, something hard, something bad, something difficult, and you make a choice to find joy. And this builds up your endurance. This builds up your endurance. And it works. I mean, we see the church grow the most where the church is persecuted the most. So basically, the the Christians with the worst lives, the church grows there the most. And we even see this like in history. The church grew and grew and grew and remained. The the Jewish authorities, the Roman authorities, all the authorities throughout history fell away. But the church stayed and grew because they knew how to persevere. Because all the bad things that were happening to them that would destroy other people, they were, ab- they were able to find joy in those situations. And now we're on to verse 4. And this is kind of the end result that James wants to give us. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And he says, let endurance have. And another way to translate this, this is an imperative verb. Endurance must have its perfect result. So he's telling us, endurance must have its perfect result if you do these things. It'll only happen if 
Christians, if, if us as followers of Jesus, respond in this way that he's calling us to? It must have its effect if we do what he's asking us to do. And we get this word perfect, have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Another way to translate this is mature, right? It's not necessarily like perfect, like there's, you know, I'm perfect like Jesus, you know, without sin. Although there's, a, there's an emphasis of that, or there's a bit of that in this word, but it's, it's more like maturity in this life. Like I'll, I'll attain maturity, but then the goal is also perfection through eternity. When I actually do become like Christ, when I, when I am glorified, then there's that perfection. But, but maturity, and you can see because it goes with complete at the end of this verse, is the ultimate goal. In other words... This, this is the goal, right? Or I should say, this is the gold. That was a stupid pun, sorry. But this is the goal, right? The, the, the maturity, the completeness, the perfection. Remember that kind of messed up gold nugget you saw? Well, this is what God wants us to become. And guess how he gets us there? From the messed up nugget to this perfect gold bar, trials and hardships. That's how he gets us there. That's what the Bible is telling us here will get us to this state. The trials. This is the full effect of joyful endurance and hard in hardships. It's perfection. Trials produce mature Christians. And that's what I was talking about that I've seen with some of the people, even among our our church family. I've seen that maturity that trials have produced. And finally, he he says that you'll be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. There's nothing you will need that you don't have. Trials brings this about. Trials gets me to the point where when I do face something, a hardship, something bad, I lack nothing that I'll need to get through it, to find joy in it. That's where James wants us to be to that point where we we have everything we need when when a trial comes about. So let's talk about some application. I was reading this and I was wondering, is the opposite true? Is the opposite true? If you don't do this, are you hindering God from doing what he wants? If if hardships come my way and I'm that kind of uh, a dirty, crusty lump of gold, Am I going to stay dirty and crusty, or am I going to even get dirtier and more flawed if I, if I hinder God from doing what he wants through me by not finding joy? I mean, may, all of us, some of us might know people that are bitter and have hate. Maybe some of us are struggling with those things. Those are people that went the other way when a trial came about. Something happened, and they couldn't find the joy. Not that they had to feel joyful about it, but they couldn't look at it with joy and look at it as a joyful thing. And it stuck with them and it just caused bitterness and hate and brought them further away from God. And is it also true that, could it be without trials that we can't attain the maturity, the completeness, the perfection that God wants for us. You know, people always ask, people that struggle with belief in God, they're like, why do bad things happen to good people? Oh, you're a Christian, then why did you get in a car wreck? You're a Christian, then why did you get fired from your job? Why do evil things happen? Right, the problem of evil. Could it be that at least why bad things happen to Christians is God is using these things to refine us and take us from that that lump of kind of crusty gold to the beautiful gold bar. These trials bring us to that point when we see joy, when we find joy in them, when we look at them with, oh, God is using this to build me up. God is using this to change me. God is using this to get me ready for the next trial that's gonna come along. We go into trials differently 
than someone who doesn't know the Lord. Because we know the outcome is good. The outcome is God's refinement. The outcome is God's making me more and more ultimately like Christ. We have a promise and a claim. You, if you follow Jesus, have a promise and a claim that is different from others. We have a promise that God will use these things. God uses all things for the good of those who love him. He will use these things to refine us and to build us up. But it's not easy, right? It's, it's so easy said, but it's not easy done. But it's like following Jesus' commands in a sinful world. Jesus says the, the, the road to life is hard and few find it. But this is the road to life, going through these hardships and being refined and being made more and more like him. I was watching right actually before I came here, I was watching a video on the news and they were interviewing a a man whose niece had just actually died in the the shooting in Texas. And it was, the, the caption of the heading was, see why this man forgives the shooter, his niece's shooter. So of course, I mean, you know, I click on it, I wanna see, I hope he forgives for the reason I think he should forgive. Um, but they interviewed him and he says, you know, I don't, I don't hate that person. I don't hate the police if they made mistakes. I don't hate whoever, all the people that everyone's blaming, even the actual shooter, I don't hate that person. He says, I, I, I forgive that person. I, I'm angry, but God tells us, and he actually says the word Ephesians in Ephesians chapter four, to forgive those who sin against us. And the, the reporter, you can see it in her face, she's just so confused. She's like, what? You're gonna bury your niece like in a couple days and you're forgiving the person? It's like, yeah, that's what God calls us to do. And I watched that right before I, I came here and I was thinking, this is, this is what James is talking about. And I don't use that example lightly, but I think it's an example of something terribly tragic happening but being faithful to God in the midst of that. And this person had clearly grown more and more mature to be able to face trials like this and say, no, I forgive him. I forgive him, I trust the Lord. He had a hope, he had a response that was different and even confusing to others. He had hope and forgiveness and that's what James wants us to have. That's what God wants us to have through reading the book of James, to have joy in trials because it refines us to get us to where God wants us to be. Would you pray with me? God, it's weird to stand here and it feels weird to stand here and thank you for trials and the hardships that come our way. But I do thank you for those things because I know that in my own life, you use them to to build endurance, to build up my faith, to refine my faith, to be stronger and able to bear even more. I pray that all of us tonight, in here, watching online, that we will be able to think of these hardships that we have. We all have different ones. We all have various things that have happened to us that will happen to us. May we think of them joyfully because we know the the ultimate outcome is good. The ultimate outcome is, is for our good. God, I pray that you will help us all to find strength in those moments and to be able to have the strength, to have a reaction that the world thinks, would think is crazy. Even the people, around of, uh, uh, the people around us might think it's crazy. But I pray you'll give us strength and endurance in those moments. Not to, f- not to feel happy about what happened, but to be able to consider them joy. Lord, we thank you for your word. Be with us the rest of the night. In your name we pray, amen.